Okay, good morning. If we can uh, quiet down a little bit, we'll get started. Uh, welcome to UC Irvine to the uh, Southern California Machine Learning Symposium. Uh, I'm Parikh Smith. I'm a professor here in computer science. Um, this is actually the second Southern California Machine Learning Symposium. We had one a few years ago, intended to keep it going, but people got busy. Uh, that's the way it is with machine learning these days. Uh, but there are plans afoot to keep this going on a regular basis uh, with uh, various local universities are dueling it out today to see who's going to host the next one. So uh, we may have an update later. Um, I'd like to thank the uh, sponsors of the event, uh, the Institute for Genomics and Bioinformatics, Center for Machine Learning and Intelligent Systems, CalIT2, and the Data Science Initiative. I'd also like to thank uh, Pierre Baldi and Anima Anankumar, who did a lot of work behind the scenes uh, with the program and posters and so forth. Um, for many of you, um, especially the younger folks, uh, machine learning is a fairly new phenomenon, uh, very exciting in the newspapers, uh, consumer products, et cetera, uh, these days. But uh, it actually goes back quite a while, uh, probably back before some of you were born. Uh, we were talking beforehand about pattern recognition in the 1960s and 70s, and then the first machine learning and neural network conferences started in the 1980s. Uh, there's a nice UC Irvine connection to that. In 1989, David Aha was a graduate student here, and he had the bright idea of starting the UCI machine learning repository using this newfangled thing called the internet, and uh, that turned out to be a good idea. Of course, uh, machine learning has gone on from strength to strength uh, since then, and uh, I think this morning we're going to have a very interesting uh, set of talks. Uh, one of the sort of maybe uh, themes that may link the talks together is, is uh, foundational aspects of machine learning, but also I think connections to other disciplines, uh, particularly to areas like uh, algorithms, AI, uh, links to statistics, optimization, and links to cognitive science and neuroscience. So machine learning very much builds on, on these other ideas and uh, fuses them together. Um, you'll hear all about that this morning, and I think without further ado, we'll get started with our first speaker, whose notes I have here. So our first speaker is uh, Sanjoy Dasgupta from UC San Diego. Sanjoy got his PhD in computer science in uh, 2000 at UC Berkeley, and is a professor in the computer science and engineering department at UCSD since, since 2002. He was at AT&T Bell Labs in the interim. So let's welcome Sanjoy as our first speaker. Okay, well, thank you very much, Parikh. Uh, so um, I'm going to be talking about interactive learning today. Um, so what is that? Um, and so, I mean, the first thing to, to just point out is that the usual way we do supervised learning is not very interactive at all. Okay, a data set shows up. A human being is called in to label the data. The human being goes away. And at some later point, a machine is started up and given this label data set and told to find a good classifier, okay? There's no interaction going on over here, okay? So, um, you know, um, what I'm interested in uh, is, and, you know, what you can call interactive learning, is in any situation where the human is actually engaging with the machine during the learning process, okay? So you can think of the human and the machine just sitting down together and sort of puzzling over this data set, okay? And why would one want to do this? In general, because one hopes that this would make learning easier or better in some sense, okay? So let's look at some examples of um, interactive learning, okay? So um, one, one kind of interaction that's been studied a lot is what's usually called active learning. And the, the motivation here is that um, very often it's easy to get lots of unlabeled data, but labels are expensive, okay? So for example, if you're building a speech recognizer, you can get all the raw speech you want very easily. You just put a microphone on the table, record as much speech as you like. But getting labels for this is very time consuming, okay? Somebody has to sit down and decide, you know, where does each word begin and end? Where does each phoneme begin and end? It's very painful, okay? And so there's this practice of active learning where basically the machine and the human sit down together, okay? And the, um, uh, and the machine just adaptively asks queries, okay? So let's say at some point the machine has asked, you know, so, so the circles over there are the unlabeled points. Let's say the machine has asked for those, um, 
eight label points and has to decide what to ask for next. Well, it probably won't ask for this point in this corner over here because it can pretty much infer that that point is a green, okay? So the sort of points it's gonna ask for are the points um, in its region of uncertainty. And, um, and, and maybe um, in this way, one can get away with querying very, very few of the actual labels. Okay, um, so the sort of questions that arise here are what are good querying schemes and what is the trade-off between the number of labels you, you ask for and the quality of the final classifier? And this is something that has been studied a lot in the past two decades uh, by a variety of people, including me and John Langford and Nina Balkan and Joao Freund and many other people. And what has emerged is that there are many cases in which, you know, if you have n unlabeled points, you can wind up asking for labels of just, say, log n of them, or sometimes square root n of them, and infer the rest, okay? And so this can lead to a huge savings in uh, the amount of um, labeling that needs to be done. Another kind of interaction, a more sophisticated kind of interaction, could be called feature feedback. Okay, and this is where the human not only provides a label, but also identifies some relevant features. Okay, so for example, let's say that it's a document labeling scenario. So the human being is reading the document and says, okay, this is sports. But if the human has gone to the trouble of actually reading this document, it can also just highlight a few words like cricket or you know, batsman, words that are highly indicative of the label. This essentially has no extra cost for the human, but can be super useful for the machine learning system, okay? Because it, in a sense, it helps with feature selection in a very high dimensional space. And this has been explored by uh, various people who do text classification like Andrew McCallum, okay? Uh, similar things have been looked at in computer vision by uh, people like Serge Belongi and Pietro Perona and Kristen Grauman, where, for example, um, you know, um, uh, let's say we're trying to recognize different birds. Um, so the computer gives the human a picture of a bird and says, okay, I think this is a canary, okay? And then the human says, no, this is not a canary, this is a warbler. Now, in addition to providing that label, the human also clicks on a part of the bird, like the beak, okay? Some sort of feature that discriminates between these two classes. So that's another kind of feature feedback. And so the questions over here are, what are the benefits that you know, in, in what are the sort of uh, statistical benefits of getting this kind of feedback over labels alone? And so we've studied this in, in many um, situations, and uh, the benefits are, you know, very significant um, for a wide variety of different classifier types, linear classifiers, decision trees, and so on. One of the particularly interesting aspects of this kind of interaction is that it's inherently ambiguous. Okay, so in the bird example, the human clicks on the bird's beak but it's not clear exactly what the human means. Is it the shape of the beak? Is it the color of the beak? Is it the fact that there is a beak? You know, there is some sort of ambiguity in this feedback, and that ambiguity shows up the minute one moves beyond labels. Labels are safe, everybody knows what that means. But the minute you move to sort of richer feedback, there's a lot of this ambiguity, and it's uh, very interesting to kind of model this stuff. Okay, another kind of, um, interactive learning is interactive learning for, you know, um, as a sort of um, way to improve unsupervised learning. Okay, so unsupervised learning consists of problems like clustering, topic modeling, embedding, this sort of thing. And over the past two decades, there have been, um, ama there's been amazing progress in algorithms for these problems. Okay, so there are now algorithms that are optimal or approximately optimal for recovering Gaussian mixture models and you know, certain types of topic models and so on, okay? And so this is just beautiful algorithmic work. Um, so the good news is that now you can find you know, um, the optimal clustering. The bad news is that it still isn't the clustering that you want, okay? Um, and because there is this mismatch between the cost function and the actual needs of the user. Okay, and so this is an area that's sort of rife for interaction to improve the outcome, okay? 
And so the sort of issues that arise over here are what kind of feedback um, can be used uh, to improve the outcome of um, clustering, topic modeling, and so on. And this is something that we've been looking at for a variety of these cases. Um, but um, let me just give you some, some sort of standard ways in which this is done, OK? So let's say the machine has clustered the data according to you know, whatever algorithm it has. Um, and now it wants some feedback on it. What sort of feedback can it, can it ask for? Well, if it's clustered a whole lot of data, you know, thousands or millions of points, there's no way it can show the entire clustering to um, the human. But what it can do is show it um, the restriction of a clustering to a small number of points, like in this case, six points. Okay? Now, it's um, inconvenient for the human to, you know, so the human might sense that there's something wrong over here. It might be inconvenient to perfectly fix it. But the human can provide a small constraint like, okay, you know, I'm, uh, I know this, I'm, this isn't quite right. Well, one thing I can definitely tell you is that whale and dolphin have to be together. Okay, something like that. Okay? And this is called a must link constraint. And this is something that was, you know, um, introduced uh, uh, and explored very heavily by uh, Claire Cardi and Kiri Wagstaff. Okay? And this is something that's been used in clustering for a while. You can do the same thing for hierarchies, okay? where um, instead of, you know, so you, you, um, you do hierarchical clustering on some very large number of points, and then you present the user with a very small portion of the hierarchy, and you ask the user to evaluate it. And again, it's inconvenient for the user to actually correct the whole thing, even though there's only six of them. But the user might provide a small constraint. Um, in this case, a very natural thing is a triplet constraint to say that, OK, um, um, you know, this doesn't quite look right. In particular, dolphin and whale should be merged before zebra is merged in. Or to put it differently, there should be some subtree that contains dolphin and whale, but not zebra. Okay. And this is called a triplet constraint. It's been used for many different types of, um, uh, in many situations, for example, for uh, correcting embeddings. Um, but in a sense, it's a perfect fit for hierarchical clustering, because the semantics of a triplet are exactly a sort of tree-like semantics. OK, so there are all these different types of interaction. And um, you know, we've been very interested in sort of working out algorithms and convergence rates for these. But um, one question one could have is, uh, you know, it just seems like there's too much of a diversity of them. Some of them are supervised learning problems. Some of them are unsupervised learning. Sometimes you're getting labels. Sometimes you're getting features. Sometimes you're getting triples. You know, is there some sort of unifying framework in which all of these can be put? Okay, and, um, and that's the first thing I'll be talking about today. Okay, we'd like some sort of general framework because otherwise it just seems too diverse and too confusing as a result. Okay. So what are the benefits we'd hope for? So we'd hope that, OK, if there's a general framework in which we can put all these kinds of algorithms, maybe it'll give us generic algorithms so we don't have to develop new ones every time. We would hope that we can also get statistical bounds on the complexity of interaction. You know, how much interaction do you need to learn a good structure? Okay. And at a higher level, what would be nice is to see how this kind of interactive learning relates to the types of learning that we already know and understand very well. Okay, so for passive learning, we have these models that have, we've studied so much, the, the statistical learning theory model, which is also the back model, um, and the mistake bound model, which is a non-statistical model. Uh, for adaptive querying, there's so much work on active learning and the non-statistical version of that, which is membership query learning. So what we'd like is to sort of make connections with these things that we already understand so well. Okay, so, so, what I'll be, so the outline of what I'll do today is I'll, I'll first describe a protocol for interactive learning. So just sort of a, a very simple framework in which one can understand these interactive situations and which relates back to the things that we know. And then I'll instantiate it. Uh, you know, I'll give an example um, and show how this would gets us um, to interactive hierarchical clustering. Okay? So, so these are the components of an interactive learning problem. Okay, so I'll, I'll be talking about a certain family of problems. Okay, so we have a collection of data, which I'm just going to be calling X. These are the points you want to cluster or the points you want to label, whatever. 
Now, what we want to do is to learn a structure over these points chosen from some said G. Okay, so for example, if we want labels for all of these points, which is active learning, then G consists of all possible labelings of these points. Um, if we want a hierarchical clustering of these points, then G consists of all hierarchies over these, say, endpoints. Okay, so G is the set of structures, and we want to pick one of these structures. Okay, now there's some particular structure G star that meets the user's needs. And in many situations, the user is also not picky. So maybe there's a whole bunch of structures that meets the user needs. Okay, so that's G star. So these are the components of the learning problem. We have the, the, um, the actual data, the structures from which we are choosing, and um, the, the set of target structures. Okay, so now the machine has its best guess for the current structure, G. You know, it thinks this is what the hierarchical clustering should be. And it wants some feedback on that structure. In general, this structure will be enormous. Okay, so um, for example, a clustering of a million points. Okay, so there's no way for the human being to actually fathom this structure in its entirety. You can't show the human the entire clustering and say, is this good or not? Okay, um, and sim simply because it's too large, and sometimes because the parametrization is inscrutable. You know, you can't say. Do the coefficients of this linear classifier look good? The human has no idea how to interpret these numbers, okay? So it's like uh, the structure is something incredibly complicated, and um, there's no way for a human being to actually evaluate it in its entirety. So instead, you show it a very small part of the structure, okay? So what the human is asked to do is some sort of local spot check. And you can imagine that if you do a whole bunch of random spot checks, you get a pretty good sense of how big the whole structure is, okay? So the way we formalize this is that we say that instead of showing the human the entire structure, you show the human the projection of the structure onto some small subset of the data. Okay, so you have a clustering of a million points. You choose 10 of those points and you say, this is the projection of the clustering onto just those 10 points. This is, what, this is the clustering for just those points. Okay. And so I'm using this notation G slash S to sort of mean the projection of structure G onto the subset of points S, okay? And then the human looks at this clustering of just 10 points and says, okay, I like it, so it accepts it. Or it says that, no, there's something wrong and it provides a small constraint that fixes part of it, okay? That partially fixes it. So that's the kind of, that's the kind of interaction. And the requirement we have is that the structure is one of the target structures if it passes all of these local checks, okay? So um, if for every subset of, of three points or of five points the clustering looks good, then the overall clustering is also good, okay? Now, of course, we're not gonna show the human every subset of five points, um, and we don't need to because of random sampling. Okay, so let's just look at um, just to fix the notation, let's just look at the hierarchical clustering scenario and just see what all these, um, what all these letters mean, okay? So um, there's a bunch of data points X. The human wants some hierarchical clustering of these. G, script G is all hierarchy. So we want one of these things, okay? That's the, that's the search space. And G star, to keep things simple, let's say there's a specific hierarchy the human is looking for, okay? So G star is the target. The machine has a current guess, best guess. And it, instead of showing the human all of G, it shows hum, the human a, the projection of G into, onto, in this case, six points, okay? Um, so little s is the number, is the size of the projection. In this case, s equals six, okay? The human either accepts this, says, I like this, or it corrects a little part of it by saying, oh, um, you need, here's, here's a violated triplet, okay? And then in this case, it's pretty easy to see that if the human accepts every possible subset, then the overall structure really is the target structure for the human, okay? And for this, we need the size of the subset to be at least three, okay? So this is the overall um, sort of, this is the sort of notation that we'll be using. So um, G projected onto S, um, G bar S, okay? Okay, so here's a summary of the protocol. We have a collection of points. We want to pick a structure. Um, there are some structures that meet the human's needs. And this is the protocol, okay? So you start with the version space of candidate structures. 
the human selects, the machine selects one structure, shows its projection onto a set of size um, little s, and the human either accepts it or corrects something in it. The human provides some constraint, which um, then allows us to update the version space. Okay. Now, um, this, so what's missing over here is that, you know, so let's say we do hierarchical clustering. So in this case, G is the set of all possible hierarchies. If we build a hierarchical clustering in this way, um, the hierarchy is being chosen based exclusively on human feedback. That means you're going to need a lot of feedback. Okay? So it's also essential to integrate the geometry of the data. Okay? After all, I can pick a hierarchical clustering without any feedback at all, just by geometric concerns. Okay? So, um, so to integrate the geometry, we have either a loss function over structures, or we have a prior over structures. Okay? So if we have no feedback, we'll simply pick the structure, the hierarchy that minimizes the loss function, or that has the maximum prior distribution. And once we have a few constraints, once we get some feedback, we'll simply pick the hierarchy that minimizes the loss function subject to those constraints. Okay? And so this allows us to integrate the geometry with the feedback. Okay? And, um, and so then we have this. And so this is the overall protocol. And all of the examples I spoke about you know, fall in, into this general pattern over here. Okay? So you start with all possible candidate structures. The machine computes the best structure according to its loss function, given the feedback so far. And then it has this little loop. It shows the human a small, the, the projection of this structure onto a small set of data. The human fixes something. This adds a constraint, and so on. Okay, so that's nice. Um, uh, there's this overall sort of framework into, into which a lot of examples seem to fall. Um, so what does it, um, you know, so, so now we can think about um, what sort of querying we would do over here. So the machine is selecting some some subset of inputs. How should it do it? It could do it randomly. It could do it intelligently. Okay, so let's let's look at um, let's look at this. Um, to answer this, let's look at it by by trying to reduce the problem to supervised learning. Okay, so so the ad one advantage of writing of writing it in this way is that we've essentially made it a supervised learning problem. Okay, um, with a slightly different input space. So the input space now you can think of as being all subsets of size 10, say. And the label for a particular subset is the correct hierarchy for those 10 points. Okay? And so we now think, for example, of a hierarchical clustering as a function from a subset of points to the correct tree on those points. Okay? And, now, and therefore, it becomes a multi-class supervised learning problem. Okay? And so we can apply a lot of the uh, standard methodology um, that has been developed for supervised learning. Okay? Now, there's some small issues. Um, for example, um, in general, there won't be one particular, you know, the, the human might have several hierarchies that it's happy with for a particular set of points. But these are very minor issues. Um, uh, and, they, you know, they, they don't prevent um, um, sort of the essence of the reduction going through. Okay? Um, OK, so with that in mind, let's see what happens with random querying. OK, so the question is, so we've ha we, have interactive, we have all these interactive learning scenarios. We've tried to put them into this unified framework, which constitutes a reduction of some sort to supervised learning. OK, so let's see. So if we do random querying, can we now, say, get standard generalization bounds? OK, um, so suppose we pick our querying subsets at random. A natural error function is that the amount of error in a structure is the fraction of subsets that the human is unhappy with. Okay? So the amount of error in a hierarchical clustering is the fraction of subsets for which the human would not sign off. Okay? And um, this error is zero um, when you have a target structure, okay? when you are at one of the target structures. The problem over here is that even if queries are chosen at random, even if you pick a subset of points at random, the human is not giving you the full answer for that, entire, for that subset. Okay, so you choose a small subset of animals. The human doesn't tell you the entire hierarchy for that set of animals. It just corrects a small part of it. 
And as a result, the label data you have is not IID. Okay, so even if subsets, even if queries are chosen at random, the label data turns out to not be IID, and this breaks the statistical model. Okay, and so we end up with two cases. Okay, um, and, and so this turns out to be a design decision in these interactive learning algorithms, okay? So you show the human being a subset of animals, and you say, okay, give me some feedback. If the human gives you the full answer on that subset, okay, then it reduces easily to multi-class learning, and all the standard bounds, VC bounds, et cetera, apply, okay? Um, for, although these are for somewhat unusual concept classes. But a much better situation, a much better kind of interaction is where you present the human with a structure and just allow it to tweak a little part of it, okay? You don't, say you, you don't have to give the full answer for these, you know, for these five animals. And in that case, the statistical model is broken. And so we've been using non-statistical models like mistake bound learning, okay? And so this is the way that you get bounds. Okay, what about intelligent querying, okay, where you're allowed to, um, where, where instead of choosing a subset at random, you, you choose according to some criterion. And, and so this, and you know, again, using this reduction to supervised learning, we can, we can hope for, um, you know, we can look at work that's been done on active learning and see if some of it can be ported over to this setting. And so um, there's been a lot of analysis of active learning algorithms. And um, so I've listed five, five particular querying strategies over here in roughly decreasing order of efficacy, okay? So the optimal active learning strategy for a particular version space is something, you know, unbelievably intractable. You have to keep track of all possible concepts and you have to build a sort of game tree. If I ask for the label of this and the label turns out to be this, then I will ask for the label of that. And then if it turns out to be this, you know, so you get this complicated tree. And that's sort of the optimal strategy, completely intractable. There's a greedy approximation to that, which again, it, it requires you to explicitly maintain the version space of classifiers, intractable, okay? The next step is a scheme called query by committee, which um, all it requires you to do is to sample from the posterior distribution on the version space. Now, officially, that's still intractable. Um, it's sharply complete and so on in general. Um, but it's a kind of intractable that we are comfortable with. Okay? It's the kind of intractable that we do all the time. Okay? And then there are some much simpler schemes. Okay? But, um, so, I'll, um, so what we can look at is how you can take this query by committee algorithm for um, active learning of classifiers and now use it for general interactive learning, okay? So here's query by committee in case you haven't seen it before. Um, it's an algorithm for active learning for binary classifiers, okay? So you start with a family of binary classifiers like linear separators. Um, you have some prior on these, like the uniform distribution, who knows? And in each time you get a new data point, you pick a point at random, and now you sample two classifiers from the current posterior distribution, the, the distribution on the current version space. <coughs> so you just sample two classifiers, and you say, do they agree on this point or not? And if they agree on that point, you don't ask for the label. If they disagree on the point, you ask for the label. Okay? And when you get the label, you add it to your constraint set. Okay? So it's trivial, um, at least at a high level, to extend this to um, the interactive structural learning scenario, okay? You can literally just change the H's to G's, you know? So you initially have some family of structures like hierarchies, there's some prior on them. At each time, you pick a subset, you pick two structures at random. If the two structures agree on this subset, then you don't query. If they disagree, then you query. And then you, you get some constraints and you add them to the constraint set, okay? So unfortunately, this doesn't quite work, um, in part because um, one of the things that makes query by committee, um, you know, uh, one of the things that makes it work is that it's a binary classification problem. The structure learning problems are multi-class with, with lots and lots of classes. And so this particular check of whether two randomly sampled um, 
structures agree on a particular subset of points will pretty much always fail, and you'll just query everything. Okay, and so this has to be altered in some suitable way, but you can do that, and so you can come up with this structural version of query by committee, which has con convergence guarantees, and you can also quantify how much interaction is needed for it to come up with a good structure. Okay, okay, so um, so let's look at a particular instantiation of these. Um, let's, so we have this sort of template now for um, coming up with an um, interactive learning procedure. And let's just see how this works out for hierarchical clustering, okay? So hierarchical clustering is very nice for exploratory data analysis, structure at many scales, um, wonderful algorithms like average linkage. And as usual, you know, these algorithms, although they're wonderful, they return things that, um, you know, are not necessarily at all aligned with the specific needs of the user. Okay, and the general reason for that is that, you know, there are, when you are dealing with high dimensional data, there are just so many different ways to slice and dice it. If you're clustering animals, should you be clustering them according to the Linnaean taxonomy or according to how cute they are? Okay, there are lots of different ways to do this and they're all legitimate and there's no way that an unsupervised learning can procedure can magically guess what the user's needs are. Okay, and so some sort of interaction is, is needed. Okay, so, so now X is our set of points and script G is the set of all hierarchies on these points. So what are the ingredients we need? First, we need a method of interaction and we've already said what that's gonna be. Okay, we're going to, whenever, whatever hierarchy we have at present, we're gonna show the user a small projection of it and we're gonna get back a triplet constraint. The next thing we need is a cost function over hierarchies. Okay, so we need a cost function for hierarchical clustering. That's simple. Let's just use the cost function for average linkage. But then we realize that there is no cost function for average linkage. Okay, and then complete linkage also doesn't have a cost function. And um, okay, so we're running into trouble now. Okay, um, it's one of these weird things. There's, there seems to be a shortage of cost functions for hierarchical clustering. So let's try and develop one, okay? And once we have that, the only third ingredient we will need is an algorithm for, mi finding, for minimizing that cost function um, subject to a bunch of constraints, okay? And once we have these three ingredients, we can just use structural query by committee and we have an interactive procedure for learning hierarchies, okay? Okay, so we needed a cost function for hierarchical clustering. So hierarchical clustering, the input is a bunch of points in Euclidean space, or more generally, a bunch of points in some metric space, or more generally, just a bunch of points with some distance structure or similarity structure. Okay, so a bunch of points with some similarities on them. And one way we can represent it is as an unweighted, uh, as, as an undirected graph with weights on the edges. Okay, well, the usual neighborhood graph thing. Okay. So the input is something like this, and what we're gonna want is a hierarchical clustering of these six points. And we need a loss function for that, or a cost function. So one idea is, um, you know, hey, you know, well, why don't we just charge for each edge that we cut? But a hierarchical clustering cuts every edge in the end, okay? So that's a problem, okay? Then we can say, okay, well, why don't we do this? Let's uh, so since we're going to cut all edges, let's charge more if the edge gets cut high up and less if it gets cut low down, okay? And so let's look at an example, okay? So we're just going to charge more the higher up an edge is cut, okay? So here's an example. So um, this is our input. This is the similarity function up there. And we want to evaluate what is the cost of this tree? How much do we have to pay for this tree? We want a cost function for trees. Now let's look at the top split the top split over here splits apart one, two, three, four from five, six. So it just cuts one edge, okay? So the top split cuts one edge, so we charge it one, okay? The next split on the left side separates one, three from two, four, so it cuts three edges. Okay, so it cuts three edges, but it's a little further down, and at this point, only two-thirds of the data remain. Initially, there were six points. Now there are only four points. Only two-thirds of the data are left. So instead of charging the full three, we charge three times two-thirds. On this side, we're cutting one edge, okay? But only two out of six points remain. Only one-third of the data remains, so we only charge a third for that, okay? And so on. 
And so basically, this is the cost function that, you know, you know, you look, one has to cook up some sort of cost function. This is relatively intuitive, okay? So for each edge, you charge, okay, according to the weight of the edge. But what you do is, um, if the edge is cut all the way at the top, you charge one. If it's cut a little further down, you charge according to the fraction of data that remains at that point. Okay, and if, we wanna, if you want to state this in tree language, you would say you charge, the um, charge for each edge is whatever the weight is of that edge times the number of de descendants of the lowest common ancestor of those two points. In other words, the number of descendants at that particular location where that edge gets cut. Okay, and so you get this sort of cost function. Okay, so let's look at some properties of it. Now the cost function deals with any kinds of any kind of tree, but one thing you can show is that there could be several optimal trees, but um, there's always some optimal tree that's binary. So that's good. We only need to deal with binary trees. A second property is that if your similarity graph is disconnected, then the first thing you got to do is to separate out those components. Intuitive, okay? So so far so good, but the you know the. Um, uh, you know, we need to do more of a sanity check and just see what does this cost function do on some canonical examples, okay? So, for example, let's look at the line graph. What does the cost function do? Suppose the, the input looks like this. This is our similarity graph. What does the cost function do to this, okay? Well, let's look at two different trees. One is a very imbalanced tree, okay? So it just cuts off one point, then it cuts off another, then it cuts off another. And the other is a super balanced tree. So let's see. So for the imbalanced tree, the first cut has a charge of one. The second cut s is still in a regime where there are n minus one nodes. So it has a charge of n minus one over n. The third cut has a charge of n minus two over n. The fourth, third, and so on. And so the overall cost is n. For the second one, the first cut has a charge of one. The second cut has a charge of only a half, because only half the, half, the, half the stuff is left. And so, um, and so the unbalanced tree costs n, whereas the balanced tree costs log n. Okay, so it's a, from somewhat sensible. What about the complete graph? So the similarity graph you've been given has just got an edge between everything. In this case, all trees have exactly the same cost, and you can show that. It's agnostic, okay? And then for people who are interested in planted partition type problems, it does the right thing on that too, okay? Um, and I won't, I won't go into the details. Okay, so we have some kind of cost function, and now we would like to come up with an algorithm uh, for hierarchically clustering according to that cost function, and it's NP-hard, okay? But, you know, so is everything, so is every other clustering cost function that we know of, and so this doesn't phase us in the least. You know, essentially everything we want to do is NP-hard. Okay, and so let's look at a let's look at a nice heuristic. Okay, so it's hard. So what what sort of thing might we do? Well, we have this graph. So why don't we do this? Here's an algorithm. You do spectral partitioning to divide the graph into two, and then you recurse on the two halves. Okay, it's a sort of algorithm that you know is is already used in many contexts. Okay, and it's very simple to state. Okay, so um, at any given stage. You do spectral partitioning, or in general, you do the sparsest cut. Okay, you look for a sparse cut or normalized cut. That's an NP-hard problem in itself, but let's say you have an alpha approximation to it. And then you recurse on the two halves. Okay, so it's a reasonable algorithm. And the interesting thing is that it's actually, you can, it's a provably good approximation to this cost function. Okay, and so this is kind of weird because um, the algorithm we're talking about has got this, um, um, is looking for, you know, so we're, we're describing an algorithm that's looking for sparse cuts. Sparse cuts are like ratio cuts, but there's nothing in the cost function that has any ratio in it, okay? So the ratio aspect is just emerging organically from it because we are looking hierarchically, because we want to build an entire hierarchy. So it's, it's kind of a, an unusual justification for these um, recursive spectral partitioning methods, okay? Great, so we have an algorithm. And um, so we've checked the second box. And the third box that we need to check in order to, um, uh, in order to produce our structural query by committee algorithm is simply a way of minimizing the cost function subject to a bunch of constraints. And it turns out that that's quite doable. Okay, and I'm not gonna go into the details.
So um, I should be wrapping up soon, so I'll just show you some examples, OK? So this is an animals with attributes data set. And this is without interaction. This is just to show you just a little example of, the, of, the, um, um, of this clustering algorithm at work. You know, it's something fairly reasonable. This is a, a data set in which there are either 50 or 85 animals, I'm not sure. Um, and they have, you know, a few dozen attributes. And, um, okay, and, um, you know, it puts, uh, it puts the aquatic stuff up there and so on, okay? Anyway, so it comes up with some clustering. And of course, it's not perfect. It doesn't correspond exactly to uh, the Linnaean taxonomy. And so then we can begin an interaction process. And so here's an example of what the interaction looks like. So in this case, we said, OK, let's do interactions where we look at subsets of 10 points. So it randomly picks a subset of 10 points. This is just for random querying. It randomly picks a subset of 10 points and shows this to the user. Okay, it says, OK, does this look right? And um, to me, it looks just fine. But apparently, there is something wrong with this. Okay, um, So uh, it is the case, apparently, that that tiger, you see, so tiger is down here and Kali is up there, and apparently they should get merged before gorilla is put in. I don't understand, you know, to me this is all, they're all just food, but you know, for some, so that's supposed to be done, okay? And so when you do that, the user supplies that constraint, and then, you know, uh, and then it goes back in, and then it produces a new hierarchy that meets the constraint, and so on, okay? And then you do this, you know, you do this uh, a few times, and then you get the right you get the right hierarchy. Okay, so this is an example of the way this interactive process goes. And this is for passive querying. Okay. So the cost function is doing something fairly reasonable. Okay, and actually another cool thing you can do with the cost function <coughs> is that you can force it to just make splits on individual features, and in that way you can get an interpretable hierarchy. Okay, you can say, okay, the only splits you're allowed to make in the graph are along actual features. And so then you can label each split according to a feature. OK, but let's look at query by committee. For that, I need a prior on the, um, on the space of hierarchies. And one prior that would, be, would, would make a lot of sense is e to the minus the loss function. That's a simple prior to use. We decided to try something different because um, there's this really beautiful prior on trees called the Dirichlet diffusion tree. Um, and this is due to Radford Neal. And um, it, has a, it, has, it has a lot of cool things about it. So we decided to use that. And you know, in this case, you, the way you do sampling, uh, the way you sample a tree is by Metropolis Hastings, uh, by a random walk Metropolis Hastings, and using you move subtrees around at a time. Okay, and it turns out that it's easy to incorporate user constraints into this sampling process while maintaining the you know irreducibility of the state space. And and so what we do is we just run the sampler, and every 100 iterations of the sampler, we'd query. Um, We'd, we'd do a query, okay? So this is active querying, and I can show you some examples of, of, of what happens, okay? So, okay, so this is on some subset of 20 news groups, and, and so this graph over here shows the distance from the best clustering, from the correct hierarchy, okay? So this means you've, you've got to the right point, and average linkage, you know, um, is not doing that well. If you look at the Dirichlet diffusion tree by itself, then um, you know without any interaction, its log likelihood keeps improving over time, but um, it's basically unrelated to its actual performance. And then with querying, you very you you quite rapidly converge to the right answer. Okay, and this this something similar holds for a bunch of other data sets. Okay, so um, I'll just. Um, and in a, you know, in a minute, with just a few open problems. Uh, the, the problems that I think are most interesting are to explore modes of interaction. You know, so what kinds of interaction are sort of convenient for a human and lead to reliable feedback? Um, and I think that this is not something that's outside the realm of theory. So I think it's kind of an interesting question. And I, the second question, I won't go into the, the bottom two, but the second question that I find very interesting is just this communication gap. Once, you get, once you're doing this interactive stuff, you really want the human to explain stuff to the computer, or the computer to explain stuff to the human. And yet they have completely different representations. So there's this sort of communication gap that has to be bridged, and it's kind of an interesting um, issue. OK, well, um, thank you very much. <laughs>
we have time for a few questions. No, the, the assumption that it has to satisfy is that if all projections are correct, then the overall thing is correct. So that's what it has to satisfy. And in fact, I was actually talking about a very restricted form of projection where the projection is onto a subset of the data. When you're doing stuff... So what does that mean then for a general... Because the data and the set G up to that point were unrelated. You're suddenly not related through this projection. That's right, yeah. So in general, you can look at any, at any situation where the structure you have can be decomposed into atomic units. And the, each projection is a bag of these units. Okay? And the feedback are on individual units. Yeah? If the human only sees the structure over some subset, random subset of the data, how do we pick the size of that sub subset? Because you kept saying 10, but is that, uh, does the number matter? Or how do you pick the size? Um, so there's, there's usually a minimum size. So in the hierarchical clustering case, it has to be at least three. But if you just present the human with three things, like you know, dog, cat, caterpillar, or something, very often it's a query that is um, difficult to, to answer. Whereas if the human is allowed to choose you know, something in, uh, you know, in, in a larger hierarchy that's incorrect, it's just, it just makes it easier to answer. So it's, it's purely a um, uh, sort of an HCI decision. And uh, just one more. Uh, at the end, you briefly mentioned uh, quantifying the amount of interaction that's ideal. Did you ever develop a cost function yourself on how to optimize the amount of interaction? Well, all we have is sort of bounds on the amount of interaction needed by that spe specific structural query by committee algorithm. Okay. But yeah. that's not the optimal scheme. Great. Thank you. All right. Time for one last quick question for the next speaker. So you mentioned reducing to supervised learning. Was that in trying to identify which structures to pick, or was that in terms of identifying the subsets? Um, right. So the, the minute one um, reduces the problem to getting the correct answer on a whole bunch of subsets, that's essentially a supervised learning problem. You know? So even if the original thing was something unsupervised, you, you know, hierarchical clustering, that's unsupervised. But if you think of a hierarchical clustering as just having to give the right answer on a bunch of questions, then it becomes a supervised learning problem. All right, let's thank Sanjay again.